Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <laughs> So uh, where are we today? Where are we today? I I don't know. Um, What do you think? I want to talk about the Feast of Trumpets today. So where could we be? That's next week, isn't it? Uh, uh, It'll be this day next week. Are we going to get together on Yom Teruah? That would be a good idea. Wow. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, one week before. uh, And I I wanted to show you my uh, shofar. That's a nice little shofar, isn't it? It's a very small, but yeah, you know, it was yeah. it was my my first one. It's the only one I've ever had, you know, over the decades. My son has a huge one. It's it, enormous, and uh, you, could, you couldn't get that one. Well, you know, we we only play our own instruments, you know. I see, of course. Yeah, and you know, the two trumpets, uh, one has to have a distinct sound from the other. Yeah, you know, and two that were the same. You know, how can you tell them apart? And I modified mine a little bit. I, I've got a little, uh, I drilled a, maybe, oh, I don't know what it is exactly the size, but I drilled a couple of holes in it, Ooh. like a, a flute right in this area here, see? So I can do this or that, and then I can just hold them down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Isn't that and, wild? That's brilliant. I don't know. You know, in the morning, you might lift, well, anytime, your lips are, this is a tiny little mouthpiece. Yeah. <gasps> <gasps> uh, Herb Albert is uh, turning over his grave. Herb Albert, that's great. Everyone's awake in your house. <gasps> Everyone's awake now. Yeah. In fact, uh, these little fellows here that are kind of torophobic, they uh, they kind of uh, they're covering their ears and their mouths. Yeah. You know, I actually blundered into this. It was in my shop. Believe it or not, it was a little. Uh, it's a little Kenya uh, in Nairobi trio is what they call it. There's yeah. a trio of monkeys, and uh, whenever we see this anymore, we think torophobia. Yeah. But uh, it, it's actually a little thing from uh, Nairobi, Kenya in Africa. And I don't know what the deal was with that. It was real popular back in the 50s, about 60 yeah. something years ago. Oh, 60 or something. Wonderful. Yeah. I just saw it and I thought, man, I've got to put this thing on the camera and show it to you. Yeah. That's, yeah. Where, you, that's where you got the, uh, the poster from for Torophobia. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, you who gave that to me. I was seeing some pictures of and i and i we, you know, normally we associate that with see no evil hear no evil speak no evil but in terms of the way we're programmed we're told to you know kind of stay away from that torah yeah. you know uh paul said this and uh, you know we don't want to have anything to do with legalism yeah, so yeah, i associated legal. yeah i associated the the way these people behave, these these monkeys were behaving with uh, the way a lot of Christians and myself, when I was told to stay away from the Torah, yeah. you know, uh, not to obey, you know, because if you obey, of course, you're a legalist. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've been speaking to a couple of people who are, and they're overseas, and they they've obviously, I think they've come out of Christianity, but they've got a lot of the the, the Judaism in them, or some people do, and they they're getting a lot into the fear of uh, not being able to do everything right, and they're afraid they're not going to make it. Uh, they're afraid that they're going to get struck down. Uh, 
afraid of Yahuwah um, because they can't get everything right. And some of them are young believers and some of them aren't. But um, where did, because I mean, some people in Scripture were, they, they look at men in the Scripture and they think, oh, well, that, that guy was walking with Yahuwah and he only made one mistake and he was this or he was that. How do you talk to people? Because I I've, I've said to a few of them, look, just, just mellow out a little bit. You've got to realize that we do this in love. Oh, yeah, but what about this and what about this and what about this? I can't get this right and I can't get that right. And, and I'm trying to say, well, he gives you time. Like, I'm not trying to say don't be obedient. I'm just trying to say, well, if you can see something that you're meant to be, you can only overcome and grow, you know, the way you're going. You can't, the fact that you can see that you're not there yet is a start because no one else cares. How, how, how would you deal with people or talk to people like that who are so into the getting, because you were talking about legalism, um, getting everything right straight away and, and not satisfied and they can't sort of break into the love because they see all these things wrong with them. And How would you? Well, uh, in addressing that kind of a problem, when we first start out, we gain a little knowledge and then the knowledge <laughs> leads to more knowledge and then we become more aware of what we're, our shortcomings. And, uh, but what we're really aiming at is, of course, as you mentioned, love, and it's a relationship. So if you have a relationship with Yahusha and he's guiding you into all the truth, and then you learn from the writings how he prayed for you and how he died for you and how much he loves you and that there's no way that anything in heaven or on earth can separate you from that love that he has for you, then you start to get, get just a glimpse of the power of his love. And once you re experience that, then there's not really a lot of things that you can possibly think of to do to improve that, except for to open up to his, his words and to listen to his still voice, his small still voice, that uh, he's reprogramming us from the inside with all this knowledge. See, what we're learning in our knowledge is his will, his will for us and uh, we can't look at ourselves and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm vile and corrupt. We, we should do that, of course, but not in terms of his judging us, but in terms of his mercy and his forgiveness for our being centers. And that uh, every day I, I try to walk, walk with him in prayer and listen to his voice, program myself with his word, and listened for his instructions for me today and to wash me from the inside of my vessel, the inside of my spirit, to keep me out of control and him in full control. And then your mind is not so much on yourself, you know, and uh, then you're thinking about him. You're taking your eyes off of him when you're thinking about yourself and you're looking at your vileness and, and your malicious nature. You know, we are bent we're we're broken but he can straighten us out and he can make us a, a a vessel that he can pick up and use every day even if it's a common vessel and he uses us just like a household vessel and uh, that's what we have to make ourselves open to rather than taking our eyes off of him and looking at ourselves and then there's those that look they look at one another and go it makes me feel better when I can condemn you, <laughs> and and you know it's just it's just all wrong. When we get our eyes off of him, we, we're we're looking at someone else or ourselves, then we're off the mark. And I think that's where it really kind of pivots from. You know, that's the core of the problem. It's uh, it's just keep your eyes on him and how great he is, not how wonderful we are or how or how, you know, far below the mark we fall. It's him that matters. And, and as long as he can use us, you know, a lot of the people that we read about in the scriptures, uh, they did wonderful things for a long period of time, but others only did one thing, and they uh, did that mission or accomplished that task, and they were they just disappeared from the scriptures. And sometimes, uh, well, we can't ever necessarily expect a be a part of prophecy, although some people today do think that they are in the prophecies personally, and I don't agree with them, but uh, because, uh, you know, I think that uh, we all corporately are in the prophecies, you know, as a 
as the houses of Israel and the house of Yehuda, we are in the prophecies, you know, in the, in the last times, in the last days. But uh, we have to work together shoulder to shoulder and learn to love one another. That's a new commandment that Yehusha gave us. And we, we must overcome that, uh, you know, controlling Nicolaitan spirit and learn how to love one another. And uh, in, 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 but in terms of what you just asked, I'd say that, you know, it's mostly us keeping our eyes on him and how great he is and the wonderful things that he's doing rather than what we can possibly do because we really can't do anything without him. No. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're in a harvest. You know, yeah. We're working side by side and he's got time to, you know, we've got a job to do. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those, those people said, why was me, why was me, why was me? Well, it's got a job for you to do, so, you know. Yeah, we have to stay busy. Yeah, and I thought it was uh, good advice you gave somebody a few weeks ago where they were saying, should I stay where I'm planted? Or I think it was a particular circus they were in or somewhere, and you said, oh, yeah, great, fantastic, because that's where the lost people are. If you feel led to stay where you're at um, with him inside you, well, a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people don't realize it, but uh, any assembly we go to, there are wounded people. They're they're hurting. They're 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 broken, and they're just looking for truth, and that's what they're searching for. And if you run away from them, you know, I mean, the people that go to the Christian assemblies are exactly where we were at one time. Not that we're any better now. It's just that we have more truth and more love, and we see the goal a little clearer and brighter. However, we're not uh, to put ourselves above them. We're just maybe a little further along in the race, just slightly, and we need to look back and go, keep going, encourage them, instead of going, you're all wrong. <laughs> you know, don't tell them what's wrong. Tell them what to do, you know, and just let the light guide them instead of, you know, bashing them and saying, well, here's a list of things that you're doing wrong. You know, just show them the truth, and and the more their their heart gets closer to Yahusha's heart and beats in time with his heart, then they're going to understand his will, and they'll see the things that they do as witchcraft is what it is, is what they're doing, because it's all rebellion. You know, and when we're uh, in rebellion against his will for us, then we don't see clearly, and we're just doing following what some leader told us to do instead of what his word says. And that's the thing that when I came to my senses, when I woke up in Christianity, I went to my pastor and I said, this book has these things that are very primary and it goes all the way through. And yet what we do in the real world here is completely different from this. Why is that? Because we were practicing witchcraft. We were in rebellion in, in the Christian denomination, you know, and, uh, you know, the Sunday worship and, uh, you know, and getting together on Sunday every week. What's that about? Who says that that happened? Yeah. And, you know, and uh, the festivals like the like Christmas and the bunny rabbit thing. And, and I just said, this stuff doesn't even, it's not even in here. You know, <laughs> it's just this. There's another format in here and we're missing it. It's like it's it's foggy or it's unclear, but we don't because we, we don't understand it because we're programmed with this other level of human behavior, you know, uh, based on uh, an architecture that's designed to keep us away from what we're supposed to do. And, and it keeps us so busy, or keeps them so busy, as we were, that as you were in the circus before, it just keeps you so busy that you just forget all about what the depth and the roots of your faith really are. Mm. So it's witchcraft. Your next seminar is about witchcraft, isn't it? It is. Uh, you who are willing, the next, uh, if you quote James 4, you have to, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but uh, yes, my plan is to address the topic of witchcraft, and there's a lot of, there's a billion ways you could go about that, but uh, I'm going to show the, the dark side, but I'm also going to show the light side that is has caused people to not even see it as witchcraft. I mean, things like birthdays, where did that come from? Is that witchcraft? Yes, it's 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 rebellion. It's something that if you put on the cone hats and burn this fire on top of a cake. 
<laughs> you know, where is that coming from? <laughs> you know, chant that, make wish to a genie. <laughs> wish to a genie, make a wish after you blow out the candles because the smoke will carry it to the heavens. And it's just it, you, whose name is it used anywhere in there? And if it was, it would probably be even worse because you're not to worship him in their way either. Deuteronomy 12, you know, you know. But that's not how. That's not why we do it, though. And that's not the way I understand it. He understands my heart. Mm -hmm. But Deuteronomy 18 doesn't want us to have anything to do with divination or sorcery or mumblers and chanters. And, you know, en enchanted is, a, is an interesting word because when something is enchanted, it means that someone has cast a spell upon it. A spell meaning some words were spoken to speed a spiel. And that enchantment is the thing that has to get broken, you know, like the Snow White uh, story, uh, you know, and all, and all the fables, you know, they're all filled with witchcraft. Yeah. You know, a lot of Disney and things, you know, they're all enchanted and, you know, it's just, and programming little children with that sort of thing, it's just yeah. so sad. And yet... Yeah. yeah. We, we, can, we can believe some of the... Um yeah, the occasional cartoon you come across with the kids and it's just complete sorcery and they've got pagan names of idols going through everywhere and you just, all the Greek pantheon and, you know, and you just think, oh, look at this, they're getting them young, aren't they? They do. So, so trumpets, take us through the uh, next week, I think it is on the fifth day, we've all got to take the day off work. Yeah, some people are doing it a month later, of course, because their year started... Uh, a little later because they saw it that way. Now, I look at the older brother, you know, Yehuda, the way that the older brother has been doing it for thousands of years is the correct way, although we want to look for different little ways sometimes and we get uh, carried away by different uh, viewpoints uh, in the U.S. Naval Station and all that stuff and uh, what a tukufa is. I mean, you know, those are words you can look up. And, but the, the idea, though, is the seventh month, the first day of the seventh month, is an unfulfilled festival that we have to do as a rehearsal because, you know, the bride, the bride has to rehearse. And we uh, operate in, in step with Yahuwah's redemption plan. And the seventh month begins the actual harvest time of the earth. Now, that's not true below the equator there. You're headed towards spring, I guess. Or you're, is it tomorrow, the first day of spring? Yes. 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 And then, uh, well, t tomorrow is the first day. Of, actually, there's in Scripture, there's only two seasons. There's summer and there's winter. And uh, in the northern hemisphere, where Israel was covenanting with Yahuwah, is what the whole earth has to go by. Uh, whether you're below the equator or above the equator. But uh, since we understand that the first moon is, according to the northern hemisphere, at a certain time of year in the spring, so we call it spring, though. They, they call it spring, summer, fall, or autumn, and winter. But in Scripture, there's only two seasons. There's summer, and then there's winter. And it, they're six months apart. And... Uh, one is uh, actually a warming period, and the other is a cooling period. And it has to do with when the sun is at the equator, you know. So, you know, you have that, what we call the equinox, you know, when the night and the day are the same in length. Okay. okay. And, uh, anyway, that's, that's what's going on. There's a, so the tipping point, the sun starts to come up for us in the summer and for you it's going away so it becomes more winter and right now the sun is um, moving away from us from the equator it's starting it, as of tomorrow we're going to have the first day of what they call fall or autumn and actually it's the beginning of winter because that's you know koref is the hebrew word and the um, uh, kayats is the word for summer Kayats has to do with life, you know, Kai, life. That's summer, Kayats. And Koreth, ooh, it's getting very Koreth, you know. And, uh, very wintry, yeah, very winter. It's Hebrew for winter. And so mm -hmm. those two seasons. And the, uh, the, the, the seventh month 
is the festival month. So all the things that have been growing and storing away their carbohydrates and their fruit, uh, it's ready to be harvested now. And so anyway, it's coming up next, well, summer ends and winter begins for us tomorrow. They call it fall. Um, and I'm, I, I sound completely uh, insane, probably, to most people that are listening to this, but it's just the way it is in Scripture. They only know It only knows of two seasons. But uh, we're conditioned differently to distract us, you know. Does that make but, sense? Yeah. Had you ever heard that before? Uh, uh, and, yeah, yeah. Some, some say the former, what is it, the latter, former and the latter, or something like that. No, that's rains. Yeah. That's yeah. rains. That's, that applies to that. The former rains apply to the spring rains, and the latter rains apply to the winter rains. And so uh, the first day of the seventh month is coming up, and that is a, a moon, you know, that it's a black or dark moon, and that's, that's supposed to be a Sabbath, so we, we want to recognize that time. And it's called Yom Teruah, which means the day of the shout. And that pre predicts the day when it really happens. And I understand it to be on time because everything that Yahoo has done redemptively has always been right on time. In the fullness of time, this happened. And uh, Yahushua was sacrificed. Yahushua raised from the dead, you know, and uh, in the midst of that week, you know, and that was first fruits. And then we have Shabuoth, and that, that was the outpouring of the spirit of Yahushua into his people, the Nazarene. And so all these things happened on schedule, on their day. So the seventh month, one of these years, when we're ready and prepared, there's going to be a great blast from a shofar blown by an archangel, a huge blast around the earth. And most people are not going to know what that is. But something is going to happen, and we're going to go, that's it. And then we'll go, he's coming. And then we'll be ready. And then the, on the 10th day of that of the seventh month, Yom Kippur. See, Yom means day. Yep. Now, it isn't Yom, because Yom would be a sea or an ocean or a lake. So it's Yom. And then Yom Teruah is the, seven, is the first day of the seventh moon. And it's the day of the shout. And that uh, is going to be the day that we, a lot of us, expect that will be the day that the dead are raised, that are in Messiah, in the first fruits. Because not all the dead will be raised, just those that are, that are first fruits. And those that are yet alive, we expect sometime later, maybe that day, but maybe it'll be on the 10th. We aren't sure. It's not our job. It's, it's Yahushua's job to know. But on the 10th, there's going to be another thing happen, and that's, you know, Yom Kafar, the day of the covering. And, you know, that kind of always, or they call it Yom Kippur, but, or Yom Kippur, they mispronounce it. Is that the but day they used to call the Day of Atonement? Is that that one? That is it. The Yom Kafar means the day of the covering, okay. or the day of atonement, which atonement means covering. But I always thought that it was interesting that the word kafar, which means covering or atonement, that's a secondary figurative meaning. But when we also understand that we're covered, maybe that's the clothing with the immortality that we'll receive. Those that are yet alive will be clothed with immortality. And that's why I lean towards the idea that while the dead will be raised on the first day of the seventh month, and then ten days later, those who are yet alive will be covered or clothed with immortality. So we won't die, but we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And then follows, five days later, uh, Sukkoth, which is, of course, the, you know, going to be the wedding supper. You know, the, so, in, I forget, was Yahushua born... Uh, on Yom Teruah, or was he born on the first day of Sukkoth? Well, mo most of us understand he was born on the first day of Sukkoth, and then circumcised on the eighth day. So you don't think he'll come back on at, at, at the same time? Or you think he'll come back at Yom Teruah? Well, I think that uh, he'll come back on Yom Teruah, but he will not set foot on the earth at that time, probably. But he will call up to himself 
and meet in the air or, you know, in the atmosphere and call people out that are first fruits. And then when he comes with us, we'll, we'll come. And, uh, and then we'll be together forever from that point, but it'll be the wedding supper, you know. The wedding supper is, uh, you know, going to be a festival that apparently is going to last for, you know, at least the eight days. But uh, when he was born, though, he was born uh, on the first day of Sukkoth, or Tabernacles, on the 15th day of the seventh month. And then the, he was circumcised exactly eight days later. Mm. So when we're raised up, those who are resurrected in that, uh, those that are raised up, will that be when the earth is burnt? That's why they're protected from it? Or do you think they'll be protected among the flames so that it's more of a sign to those? Because the scripture says, why well, aren't they'll cling on to your garment, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, there's going to be a difference, a distinction made. Malachi uh, chapters 3 and 4 are vital to understand because it's it's going to be noticeable to everyone that there's going to be a distinction between those who are not obedient and those that are obedient. And when we, uh, let's see, we were talking about, oh yeah, we, we're, we're talking about end time, so we've got uh, seals and we've got trumpets and then we've got bowls. So these things, he says, will happen very quickly. These things come upon the earth quickly. So the bowls aren't going to like hang out for years. They're going to be wham, 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 you know. And uh, the trumpets, the last trump would be the seventh trump, and that is the beginning of the bowls, you see. So we don't, it's not our place to know how long they'll last or how, you know, where, you know, every, every detail. That's his department. But, oh, the last, well, the last trumpet is the beginning of the bowls or the vials, the bowls. Right. Wow. So you've got seals, and then the seventh seal, and just before he opens the seventh seal, the secret of Yahuwah, the secret of Elohim is ended. And the greatest secret that he's kept from the adversary has been who we are, and what we are scattered around the earth. And, that, and you know, because there, even the Christians have been thinking there's, there's uh, Christians and there's Jews. Yeah. That's basically it. And that's not it. You know, because every single person on this planet is some in some way touched by the seed of Abraham. Uh, and so he's sown into the nations, and he has become the nations. That's what the prophecy was. And all we have to do is say, well, we are scattered tribes. You're in Australia. I'm in North America. How did we get here? Yeah. You know. some, uh, some people, when we were studying, when we were still in Christianity, they said that the the seventh seal, seventh trumpet, and seventh bowl all ends at the same time. Is that true? I don't think so. I I think well, I think that there's probably the the seals, and I and I, but I do understand the telescopic idea that these things all happen together and they're just different manifestations. And I'm not saying that it's definitely not correct, but I'm thinking that there's going to be a seventh trump, and we have reach the point where we understand that a great secret has been revealed, and that is that we are, and like Ephesians chapter 3, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 3, describe us as being, uh, you know, the nations, and this covenant that we're broadcasting into the earth as we cry out on the hills of Ephraim, a prophecy from Yermiyahu 31 verse 6, uh, the Nazarene are crying out. And that's because Yahushua is the head of us. And he's crying out through us. And that's what this is all about that's happening. But the, uh, when, the, when the bowls start, it's going to be rapid fire, you know. And uh, all the, all, although the other things might have happened slower, the, it's getting faster and faster and faster and faster. The uh, prophecies about the, uh, the festivals, you know, those are the redemption plan of Yahushua. It's all his activity. Nothing we're doing is, oper is, is in the uh, redemptive plan, but it's all him doing it. And he's always done everything right on time. 
And I mm -hmm. expect that the first day of the seventh month, one of these years, and I always look forward to the, the seventh month with great awe because it could be this year. And, you know, every year I say that, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but we don't want to get our expectations out of alignment, you know. Leave it in his in his camp because he's mm -hmm. doing it anyway. It's not for us to know all these secrets, but uh, about when it's going to happen or who's going to get taken first or whatever, you know. But we do know that there's going to be very few in this first resurrection, relatively few, because it's the first fruits. It's just the beginning. It's the uh, it's like the it's almost like a tithe, you know. And then the thousand years will transpire. And then at the end of that, all the dead are raised, the sea and the earth, everywhere people ever died, their, their spirits will be resurrected and clothed with immortality and then judged according to, those, to their names, whether, whether or not they are written in the book, in the scroll of life. But the first resurrection, is, as I understand it, is, is our determined, we're determined by whether our names are in the book of remembrance, which is... See? You think everybody will be clothed in immortality and then obviously they'll experience it and then see what they've lost. Yes. That's, that's interesting. Yes, I, I tend to believe that. But uh, the book of Malachi describes the book of remembrance. And that's a treasured mm -hmm. possession. That's people who thought upon his name and spoke to one another. And that's what we're doing, mm -hmm. you know. And we're saying Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahuwah. Yeah. We're yeah. saying that again. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahuwah. So I'm Do you think the um, the seals have been opening since, uh, for the last few thousand years? I tend to believe that because the persecutions and so forth that have been going on all through time, the Roman Empire and you know the uh, subsequent uh, takeover of the faith by the sun solar cult. Of Rome, of Rome, and then the persecution of uh, the Yahudim, and it's all about Israel, you know, mm. because Israel is the topic, and the Christians have been putting themselves in that place when, in fact, they're the persecutors. Yes, and yet they look back and they say, "Well, we were persecuted by Rome. Those were not serene that were persecuted by Rome, and there are there are people that, you know, the beast will kill his own too, you know. I mean, the, the beast system." Because the beast isn't friendly to anybody, you know. Mm. Uh, if you if you get a little bit out of line, like for example, if a pope were to just get a little bit out of line, they will kill him. The inner circle. Yeah. You know, when the, when in eighteen in eighteen seventy three or no seventeen seventy three, wasn't it when the Jesuits were outlawed? You know, they killed the pope immediately because the pope put out an edict and said, the Jesuits' order is now kaput. And uh, anyway, they poisoned the Pope immediately. <laughs> wow. And then three years later, the Illuminati pops up, you know, with Adam Weiss, who's a Jesuit. Mm. Anyway, that's just an illustration, but he, the, the beast system will kill their own, you know. Well, we found it interesting uh, a few years ago when we were reading uh, Revelation, and we realized that uh, when, the, when the lamb appears in the throne room like he's been slain and he's the only one who's able to open the seals and he obviously opens them, we, well, we thought back then, and I'll ask you if you agree, that was when Yahushua, that was between Yahushua dying and rising, wasn't it? When he presented his blood, when he appeared in the throne room? Well, the that would make sense. Uh, that would be logical. Uh, so it's been happening since then. Yeah, and I, I think that the seals were the beginning, and then you know, and then you have the trumpets, and those could be. We could go back in history and try to identify all those things, but that's just and mm -hmm. see. These are all things that it's in his. He's the one doing it. So uh, for us to arrogantly uh, say that this is going to be this and that's going to be that, uh, I try to not dr start drawing charts, you know, and identifying <laughs> things. You don't like drawing charts? <laughs> no, because uh, 
every every idle word that we speak and every bit of deception whoever deceives the little ones and uh we're not just talking about children we're talking about children in the faith you know and if we've caused one of them to stumble in in a in, in a point that uh, we might have caused them to you know be confused it's very and, it's very dangerous to put all your doctrines in concrete isn't it it, it certainly is. That's why I try to just go with what the simple plan is rather than get all complicated with all the little refinements and identifications. But um, the calendar is a very argumentative topic among the Nazarene today. And I tend to trust that the older brother, that's the house of Yehuda, has been doing it for thousands of years and now in just recent decades the Ephraimites, or the House of Israel, has been coming back into the Torah and arrogantly saying, no, we know better how to do this because we, uh, we interpret words differently than you do. But you see, the way that they were doing it in Yahushua's day is, is the way they're doing it now. Although the Babylonian descriptions of some of these words, you know, we can, we can see that we need to do away with them, but we don't need to keep looking at our older brother and trying to pick the nits off of him and go, you've got all this Babylonian stuff on you. You know that? <laughs> well, they'll get cleaned up, but we've got wrinkles too. But we, we need to get together because Yahusha is in us. Yeah. <laughs> we've got a witchcraft. Oh, we sure do. Yeah. But Yahusha is in us, and he's not trying to, to make us different. He's trying to make us the same. He's trying to bring us together. So a new moon needs to be the same new moon for all of us. Yeah. Not looking up and seeing a crescent. Where's that written at? You know, at sunset, wherever you happen to be on the earth. What? That doesn't make any sense. But, you know, it, it isn't there. Even if it was there, it would, it would be strange because everybody has to start the day, the new moon, at the same time. The new moon might arrive for you at the beginning of the day uh, at sunset, but it might arrive for us, um, you know, who knows, anytime later that day. But it happens for the whole earth yeah. at the same moment, you know. It's not, yeah. it's not about the day, it's about the moon, you know. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the moon. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, um, so, brothers and sisters, next week, uh, welcome to Torah Talk, by the way. I'll say it half an hour in. Uh, uh, the uh, next week on the fifth day is uh, we take that that day off work. That's Yom Teruah, uh, but it starts the night before at sunset. So you're driving home from work. Sunset's approaching. Paint us a bit of a picture of what goes on in your house. Uh, yeah. What do you do? Uh, you know, you've got uh, yourself. You don't have any children there right now, do you? Well, I, I had my three grandchildren here last night. They oh, got God. up and they had uh, school pictures taken or taking them today. So my wife got up early and took them to school this morning. And uh, we don't get them very much, but we did get them last night. But yeah, I see my grandchildren. Uh, I have two children of my own, but uh, well, I count my grandchildren as my children too. Come on. Mm. But uh, anyway, a typical uh, understanding of scripture is that we're supposed to meet in the place where he has established his name. And there's only one place that he's actually done that, and that is in Yerushalayim. But Yahushua said that Yahuwah Yehu seeks true worshipers who want to worship him in spirit and in truth, and neither in Mount Gerizim nor in Yerushalayim will true worshipers worship Yahuwah. But wherever we are, wherever two or three are gathered, he is there. Yes. He is there. So if he's there... Then, if you have ten people or a thousand people, as long as he's there, two or three, that's fine. But we're we're scattered in the into the nations right now, just like when when Yehuda was in Babylon, they couldn't observe the festivals because they weren't there in Jerusalem, you know. But they they could observe the time. You can observe the time and worship him in spirit and in truth, but. You know, and since we can't get to Jerusalem, it's being trampled underfoot by Gentiles right now. And, uh, you know, the state of Israel is is just part of the prophecy because it, 
the house of Yehuda has to be there in order for the fulfillment of the prophecies. And they are there, but that's not the fulfillment completely in itself. A lot of Christians think in 1948 uh, that uh, when the United Nations, you know, the syndicate of crime, created the facility for the state of Israel to actually come back to the land, their plan was to see them annihilated by their enemies all around them. And it didn't happen. It's still happening slowly. They're always grinding them down. But uh, anyway, the thing of it is, that's part of the plan, but uh, it's not the fulfillment of the plan because the regathering hasn't really happened. The regathering, when we lie down in peace in our place, there will be no threats. And so that hasn't happened yet. And it's only Yahushua that regathers. But uh, anyway, those things are all yet ahead of us. And not too far, hopefully. But uh, what were we talking about? You, you. Uh, sunsets approaching. Sunsets approaching, and we get together, and usually uh, we'll place the blessing uh, on the children's heads. Uh, we're opening up a, a brand new month. We've got a the Sabbath is beginning, and and if they're if I have children, uh, I would put the blessing on their heads, and I would explain. What it, what the day represents in this place? Of course, we're in North America. You're in Australia, and uh, there will be more than two or three uh, gathered. So, even though it's a family, but we usually do it around the the dining room table because uh, the bread of life is uh, metaphoric for food, and then we'll have a little uh, meal, and we uh, read scripture. We read the pertinent scripture for that day. You know, Yom Teruah, you know, from Leviticus 23 or Deuteronomy 16, if not both. And then we understand that, you know, and we blow the shofar, of course. On Yom Teruah next week, Adam and I will make the neighborhood uh, resonate. <laughs> and it, we'll hear it echoing off of walls in the distance. Yeah. And there'll be two of us out there doing it, too. But uh, and you, you, know, that, you do that at sunset, or you do it before sunset. Have you got a some? We do it right at, at sunset, right at sunset. Yeah. So in the early minutes of the first part of the day, and the Yom Tura arrives, and sometimes, well, often, Phyllis makes a phone call if my other son is not present, and he listens to the shofars being blown too. Fantastic. Over the over the, over the telephone. Yeah. Blow it so, again for us, mate. Oh. <laughs> Blow it again. Show, show us the difference in the sound, if you can, when you put your... So is that a real ram's horn, that one? Yes, it is. It is. Right. Show us the difference in the sound when you put your fingers on the different holes. Okay. okay. Make a difference? I think so. Wow. Yeah, really yeah. Cool. We haven't got a. We got to get ourselves a chauffeur. I just got the boys one of these. So, but, uh, <laughs> I used a piece of PVC right here. Yeah. It was just a piece of uh, a plastic pipe, you know. And I stuck something in it. Uh, I forget what it was. I don't. I don't. It might have been a mouthpiece. Ah, a flute. That yeah. 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 That's not a flute. That's, That's a, a. What do you call that? A. Well, it's a horn. Yeah, a horn. Wow. Recorder, recorder, that's what they call it. Recorder, it? that's yeah. what I got one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the kids. <laughs> well. Because <laughs> uh, a sister of ours a few years ago, she got all the kids to cut out little trumpets and stick them on uh, these horn things, and we went out in the backyard, yeah. and everybody blew them all at once. And for, well, years, you know, and for yeah. years now, the kids have been going, is this, is it? Whenever Passover or Shabuos comes, this is the one with the trumpets? No, not yet, not yet. <laughs> well, a horn is actually literally a, a horn. It's a ram's horn. Like, you know, they, they, I don't know how they get their horns on them, but they, they grow out of their heads, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I think Nimrod, Nimrod had one growing out of the middle of his head. No. <laughs> but anyway, a horn is a flared object. You know, it has a little bowl shape. And, you know, I, I use this thing sometimes. 
you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the first year we got, we had uh, no ram's horn, but we are told to hear a ram's horn. So I made a a piece of PVC and I stuck something in the PVC, and I think the PVC was curved, if I remember right. It was an elbow, you uh -huh. know. And I stuck this uh, object in there, and I think it was my trombone mouthpiece. I play trombone, too. Oh, great. And, oh, great. You know, and uh, I just stuck it in there and t duct taped it in there and then blew, and it sounded fine, you know. Trombone, that doesn't have a reed, does it? No, it doesn't. It's just a mouthpiece. It's a much bigger mouthpiece than this. It's a bass instrument, actually. It reuses the bass clef. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, going off on a red herring, what what instruments do you play? How many instruments can you play? I play flute. Uh, obviously, I can play a little recorder, but I uh, play flute and guitar, and every guitar you can imagine, uh, sitar, uh, and I play a little uh, banjo, and I don't like banjos, but I still so sometimes they're, they're fun to just pluck on, but... Uh, Anyway, the uh, bass guitar, of course, and keyboard. I love keyboard. It's my first love, you know. But uh, and drums, of course. I I love drums too. I, I, I all the instruments. I I just love them. Now, reed instruments. I, I I had a bad experience with that one time, and I just said no, I can't do it. Um, it, it it's the same fingering pretty much as a flute, but the reeds are just they vibrate my whole jaw. And, I could never master that. Yeah. I didn't really try. I just stayed away from it. It was very temperamental, you know. Mm. Yeah. I like things that are a little bit more stable, you know. Yeah. 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 Keyboards. Uh, keyboards are very stable. See, guitars are very temperamental, too. The hardest instrument that I've ever picked up, and I own one. I've got a violin. A violin, I have to respect anybody that can play those. Those things are really amazing, but they're very difficult to get a good tone out of. But once you get cr across that point, it's serious. You know, you, you have to reach a certain point. I'll have to tell Josiah that. He's uh, learning violin right now. He's having violin lessons. I love cellos, too. I don't own, I don't have one, but I'd love to just, if I ever got a cello, I would probably sit there for hours every day and just, well, I wouldn't have time for that, but... It would just, it, it's a beautiful tone. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah. So uh, you've blown the chauffeur, you put the blessing on the children, you have a meal, and uh, the next day you just... Scripture. Yeah. The next day you just what? Chill. Just chill with the family, yeah. And I stay home. I don't go out of, uh, out of my place. Deuteronomy, I mean Exodus, I think it's Exodus 16, it says... Uh, for, uh, regarding the seventh day of the week, let no man go out of his place on the Sabbath, which would mean that you don't have anywhere to go. I have uh, uh, people that say, well, now you're supposed to meet together. Well, it's, it's wonderful if you're close by someone that you can get together with, you know, and who would want to discourage that? You know, that would be uh, just silly. But uh, I wanted to see if I could find something on the computer here. I've got a the seventh day of the week, we were going to talk about the number seven, remember? Yeah, yeah. And this is the seventh month. Yes. Some people like to say that uh, on the high Sabbaths, you're allowed to go out, but you don't spend money. Is that in Torah? Or is that just a... Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, and it is... You, you don't want to have to buy food or buy anything necessarily, but... I think that you can do a lot more than you could on a weekly Sabbath. For example, cooking food, you can definitely cook food. You can, you can prepare the meals uh, that, you can, that you can have. They're festivals. I mean, they're, they're family picnics. So I would definitely say that you could cook. You could probably drive. So you guys, you, could, you, guys don't, you, don't, you guys don't cook any food or do anything on the Sabbath? Not the weekly Sabbath, No. No? But we uh, we don't drive. We don't yeah. start fires. That would be a fire. See, uh, internal combustion implies combustion. And okay. if you, you want, unless you want to leave your car running all night and then drive around in a circle, because I I don't have any need for that. Uh, I don't have anywhere to go on the Sabbath. I mean, you know, unless there was a neighborhood 
a synagogue that I could just walk to, I would definitely be there. Oh, my. And then again, uh, you know, but on the Sabbath, it's for our bodies to rest. You know, that's what the commandment is. I wanted to read that seventh commandment. Guard the Sabbath day. Let's see. Oh, I have it right here. I've got it opened up. Yeah. Uh, the fourth commandment in the Torah is guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant, that would be an employee, rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah, your Elohim, brought you out from there by a strong hair, it's a strong hand, and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So, uh, you know, that's pretty clear. Oh, that is you your animals. Yeah, you can't even make your animals work. You can't yeah. get on a horse. You can't make your horse carry you anywhere. Mm. You know. Well, I just learned something. Don't, don't, because uh, sometimes you whip up a bit of a meal or something on the Sabbath. That's, that's good. Don't do it. So you prepare it the day before. Just prepare it the day before. And, uh, you know, uh, some people say that the uh, Yahudim will not even turn on a light switch. But a light switch is not really a fire. It's, uh, but they, they do guard that very, very closely. The Orthodox do. But uh, I do, I'm not afraid of turning on a light, you know. But uh, we, uh, we, make, we make the Sabbath a delight. Yeah. And we, we can play together. We can play games. We can go outside and run around in, in the air and fly kites or whatever we want to do, play ball. Um, and as long as our bodies get some, some rest, you know, that we're not, you know, it, planting things. Like, let's go out and plant the corn or let's go plant a tree. You don't want to do that. You know, get the shovel out and or start making repairs on your house, or mowing your lawn, or whatever it might be. You, you turn your foot from all those things that have to do with work and and chores. You know, just stop that. Just take the day off. And you've got six days that you can do all those things in. You know, so that's brilliant. So that was Yom Teruah. Yom Teruah, yeah, it's coming up. It's coming up. Now, of course, some people are going to observe at different times, and we're not judging anybody because we're not looking at other people. We're looking at Yahusha. And when Yahusha does something, now Israel is not only the Yahudim that are unbelievers, but also those that are of us that do believe and in the Messiah. But uh, he's the head, and whatever the head tells the body to do, then we do that. You know, and we have to be together on it, you know. But if we're all splintered off and doing different things and going, he won't, he's telling people that you can't meet together on the Sabbath. <laughs> people will tell me that they hear people say that about me. Uh, or they, uh, they have all these differences in their, in their uh, understandings. And uh, they're following, uh, you know, either loose or strict rules. And uh, they stay apart from one another over these issues. You're redeemed. The same blood redeemed you as redeemed them. Why are you so critical of one another? You know, <laughs> why would you? Yeah. I, and somebody might spell the name differently. Uh, I, what, what is that about? You know, It's okay. I mean, let, let it go. Everybody has to. They're a work in progress, you know, and. Just accept one another, you know. So the main point, we, we know how Passover was fulfilled uh, with Yahushua, and we know how Shabuoth was fulfilled with the covenant written on our hearts and the day of Pentecost. And uh, What would the main fulfillment of Yom Teruah be, the, the day of trumpets? Just in, just in a nutshell, what would, just for it's believers... It's the future. Uh, it's an unfulfilled, redemptive plan that Yahuwah has ahead. And, of course, he's been hinting at it all along, that it has something to do with the resurrection of the dead, the first 
fruits. And of course, it is a harvest time. Now, all the there's four rest days, other than the weekly Sabbaths, in the seventh month. The first day is a, it's a day of rest. He said, on the first day of the month, you do no work, and that would be different from the other new moons because the other new moons, there's no no command to not work, but there is and to not work on the first day of the seventh moon. And then on the tenth day, no work. It's a Sabbath of Sabbaths on the tenth day of the seventh moon. Not the Roman month, but the real month, the real moon. And then on the fifteenth, we have a day that we have to take off from work too, because it's the beginning of the festival. And those are future things. The first day of the seventh month points to the resurrection of the dead and his coming. And then, uh, of course, the blast, the, the, the trumpet blast. And then, of course, the tenth day is is a judgment day or a day of covering. And that would be uh, Yom Kephar. And then Sukkoth is, of course, even though it was the time of his birth, it'll be the day of his wedding next. So it's kind of interesting uh, that uh, he was born on the first day of Sukkoth circumcised on the eighth day and the wedding festival when he, when we go into the booth of Elohim will be on that day when the bride is gathered to him and they come under the kupa you see the Sukkoth, Sukkoth is a is a household it's a it's a, a great building made up of living stones and the, the kupa is like this tabernacle or the booth and it's uh, something that the Hebrew people have always gotten underneath when they get married. So we're going to come under the kupa with Yahusha and enter into the house, you know, on the first day of, the, of uh, Sukkoth, uh, you know, the 15th day of the seventh month. So these are future redemptive plans for his bride. And, of course, if we're uh, angry and poking each other and going, you're not going to make it, you've got the wrong teachings, and that, uh, if we've got our eyes off of him, we might be in trouble, you know. We certainly won't be in the first fruits, so we won't be awakened until the end of the millennium. We don't want that. So Yom Teruah represents the, uh, the trumpet blast and the resurrection of the first fruits. Right, right. So what would you, uh, how would you celebrate or observe uh, Yom Kafar? That is a very severe day. You, yeah, well, you said that. You said Sabbath of Sabbaths. Why? I know yeah. that, that was the day the high priest had to go in and they'd pull him out yeah. on a string if he was, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, they had a rope on him so that they could pull his dead body out. If they hear the bells on his on the fringes of his uh, garment stop ringing, it means he's not moving anymore. And uh, anyway, he went into the Kodesh Le Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies, as they translate. But uh, we don't use that word. We use the word Kodesh, the set-apart place, in the place where the ark was, the presence of Yahuwah. And it was a place where they would pronounce the name softly, you know, in, on that particular day. And it was also the day of the release, you know, the release of slaves, the release of property back to their owners, and the forgiveness of all debts and, on Yom Yom uh, Kafar. Was that every year? Every well, every uh, seventh year. I thought they, that happened on the fiftieth, on the jubilee. On the jubilee, definitely yes. On but the that, jubilee, but it happened on that day every year as well, did it? As far as I understand, uh, jubilee would be the only one that I can say for certainty that that was the time. Yeah, the day of release. But uh, on Yom Kafar, they. Uh, you know, I mean, when the when the temple was built and it was standing, the operational priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, uh, had to go by what they what, what was written in the law, the Torah, uh, as far as the ceremonial aspects. Now, Yahushua is the high priest now, so he's in the real Kodesh and Kodeshim. So he's in there interceding for us as our high priest. So he's the head of Israel, and Whatever he's doing, he's doing. But it's none of our business necessarily, you know. But we should understand that he is interceding for us. But we have to look at him as the head and stop looking at one another, you know, and keep our eye on him. 
So it's a very serious Sabbath, Yom very Kippur. Serious. So what should be going through the believers' minds on that day? Okay, what we do is we observe the time at sunset, we or just before sunset, that last hour or hour or half hour, we'll be sitting down and having a large meal with one another. So because we've got a whole day that we're going to go through a 24-hour period where we don't eat anything at all, but we can take water. You know, we can take water, but uh, because we don't want to make ourselves ill. So but we have, have. Sorry, Yom Teru is not a fast, is it? Yom Teru is not a fast. No, it's a fa it's a feast. Okay, Yom Kafar yeah. is a fast. It's yeah, but it's not. But Yom Kafar is not a feast. It's a moedim. It's mo a moed, a moed. But yeah, and w what we do is we have a we store away as much food as we can without making ourselves too full, and then and wherever we are, I mean, we're on in North America here, so we just meet together as a family, you know, and. We, uh, if we had friends nearby, we would have them over as well. And then uh, as a family, we get together. And in this particular one, as I understand it, is going to coincide with a weekly Sabbath. So Yes, it is. So it trumps the weekly Sabbath in that we can't eat. So we, don't, we, de we, we deny our bodies. You know. We'll actually uh, scourge our bodies by uh, afflicting our beings. See, we're going to afflict our nefesh. Our, our flesh is going to be afflicted. Because after, oh, 15 hours without food, you start to feel these creeping uh, afflictions. You know, yeah. these afflicted <laughs> feelings of, oh, I can read it and I can take this and put it in my, oh, but I will not do that. So you have to make your inner spirit overcome your flesh. Grumbling. It's like this huge arm wrestle with yourself. You've got the ability to just reach out and take it, but you won't. And because you're 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 making your your flesh do what you want it to do. And that is the I think is as many years as I've done it, is the real key to overcoming sin. Is when you can make your flesh do what you want it to instead of what the flesh wants. That's the real tug of war. It's the, you see the war where it really is. And that's what it, what it has always shown me. And if you can do that once a year, it's like a muscle. You flex that muscle and you go, no. And you just deny yourself. And your flesh goes, but, but just a little bit. And, then, and, you, and you say, absolutely not. And then you're... Uh, you know, you're having an argument with yourself. Yeah. You really feel the two natures. You can feel your spirit, the, the will within you that has to win, and the flesh that says, I have to win. And then uh, you feel that battle. So the battle is right there. And, uh, of course, there are. Why is that on the day of covering? What, when somebody's going through this battle, why, what are they supposed, how are they supposed to be associating this with Yahusha? Why are, well, we do, why are we denying ourselves on that day? That's a good question. I, I, I think it's probably related to the fact that it is a, a determination of whether our names will be inscribed in the scroll of life or not. You know, uh, I think that in pro all probability, our names, if we are first fruits, will be in both scrolls. We'll be in the scroll of remembrance and we'll also be in the scroll of life. The Lamb scroll of life. Because in that scroll, his blood covers all those that are being delivered or redeemed. And uh, the first fruits is a special treasured possession. And those are people who have overcome and they, they have meditated upon his name. And his name is very important to them. And uh, they are probably less likely to argue about how it's spelled. You know, because love is the first goal. You know, and while we may have understandings different from one another, we have to say the Hebrew is Yod He Ua He. You know, and uh, we we meditate upon that name. You know, because we are sealed in the with the Father's name. Now, the sealing has to have, you know, a seal is something that is placed upon us as ownership. 
So if he has not placed his seal of his name of, of ownership in our minds, then we are not owned by him at that point. You know. But, yeah, Yom Kafar would be the day of the covering, and it would probably be whether or not we're sealed or not. So that might be a sealing t time too. And in, in determining the the in Malachi, it says that you will see a distinction between those who obey Yahuwah and those who do not obey him. And the distinction is, of course, related to the name. And anybody who has his name on them would, of course, obey him because they love him. Not because they're trying to attain, acquire salvation. but uh, So Yom Kafar might be the day of the sealing as well. You know, Wow. When the messengers go out and seal those that are redeemed. I don't know, but I'm, I'm thinking we are sealed now. Yeah. But there's going to be a time, possibly in the future, when we will, you know, be given a, an official physical seal, you know. So just before sunset, uh, as Yom Kafar is approaching, we have a big feast, uh, and then we fast until sunset the next day. Yes, I'd load up with food as much as you can, and then because you're going to have to afflict your being, you're going to afflict your nefesh, your your uh, your spirit, and not your spirit, but your uh, your body, your, your flesh is going to be afflicted, and you're going to have a huge argument over twelve hours later with your flesh. <laughs> or not you're going to eat that. Mm. So then we now, come then we come to the first day of booze. Well, I want to mention though that if you're sick, or if you're already sick or ill, and you're or you're pregnant, and and young children too, young children, they have different uh, situations, and you need to let them have just a little bit, but they need to give up something. They need to give up most everything. But if they if they just eat a little cracker, a little one, they 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 suffer greatly without food. And it's not, it's not intended to be so much punishment and, and suffering, but it is overcoming the will to have a big piece of chocolate cake or, you know, something that would be pleasing to us. No sugars or anything like that, you know. But for young children or sick people or, or pregnant people, people like that, there's a, common sense has to be in operation. Anyway, right. you were right. saying, and then, the, then Sukkoth? Yes. How, what would you do then? Sunset's approaching, first day of booze. Uh, oh, do you, do you yeah. still put up? Do you still go and put a tent out the back, or do you do something like that? Or we've done a lot of different sorts of things. We put tents up and then put de uh, decorate them with willow leaves and branches, and uh, hang little decorations on them and inside. And then uh, right now we've got a little structure that I've put up uh, with my son Adam and. We'll put, we'll load that thing up with all kinds of fronds and and decorate it and go into it and remember when Israel dwelled in booths, you know, in the in the wilderness for forty years. So did you go in there, go in and out and do, like, or did you sleep in there or stay in there for? What do you do? We often have slept inside of the booth. And uh, if the weather is, uh, you know, in a tent, of course, you can sleep out there in the rain. Uh, and uh, we've often just taken our bedrolls out there and our sleeping bags and camping equipment and uh, just uh, stayed in the booth uh, in the, during the evening hours and played in there during the day and played games. And, you know, we get, uh, we try to teach our children a lot of things in there. You know, because going into the thing and actually doing it, you get the idea that that festival is pointing to a lot of different things. One of the things it points to is that over the period of the, the seven days of the of the Sukkot, uh, you're noticing that the leaves are starting to dry out, and some of them are starting to fall off. And it reminds you that this dwelling that we're in, the tent, is like our bodies as the as we go through the seven days. The 70 years of lifespan, uh, you begin to see the changes in your body. And the changes are happening in the fronds of the booth that you're uh, enclosed in. So, and it also reminds you that you are a sojourner 
and that you're not yet home. That booth is not yet home. That's not your real home. And neither is this our real home. See, we have another home that's being built for us. It's immortal and I've been not made with hands. And that's the important thing I think I get out of Sukkoth more than anything else. All the things that have happened, the things that are ahead, but the thing that we do is pointing to the fact that we're not home yet. And that booth, whether if, if even if you're in, a, in an apartment and you can just put up a string and a blanket, you get inside of it and put some fronds up, you know, and watch them over the period of seven days and see the tape. A is that front, like a branch? A branch with leaves on it, yeah. A freshly cut branch. And then the first day and the second day, they kind of look kind of nice and fresh. And then over the period of time, they start getting dried out and losing the, their leaves. Hmm. So do you take uh, the first day of Sukkoth and the eighth day of Sukkoth off work, or do you take the whole week off these days? Well, some people take a whole week and they travel someplace and and have you know a, a, an outdoor camping experience with a group of other believers. A uh, great many people do that. Uh, we have uh, responsibilities that we have to do with work and with uh, the, uh, I don't have a vacation. I don't work for someone else right now, except for Yahusha. And I have to, uh, you know, manage a business. But then, then there's the, uh, the fact is, uh, do, I do take off those days, though, the first day and the eighth day. And of course, I'm beyond Kafar. Of course, this year's it's the Sabbath. I'm always off on Sabbath. And of course, uh, the first day of the seventh month, next week, I'll be off too. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, and we take off work. And I, I don't take off the whole week because I don't have a vacation. I haven't had a vacation for uh, at least 10 years. And I, at that time, it was just a three day vacation. But, you know, uh, I, we went to Virginia Beach and we saw the ocean. But, uh, you know, right now, we can't really take vacations. In fact, the, the, the ministry of the ministry of Yahusha that we have is he's given us is keeping us pretty busy, and but we'll take those days off. But in the in the in between days, we're not told to rest, so we can actually do our jobs. You know, mm. great. So shipping shipping all the uh, requests that people have for us. So the first day you would have the uh, the, the the booth the. Uh the tent built before the first day, or you would? Yes. Yeah, we usually start on it a day or two before. So we have, you know, and then we cut the branches that just a, the day, just the hours before, and we blow them up, up on top so they're, they're nice and fresh. We usually bundle them together with little strings so that they're nice and, you know, intact. Otherwise, the wind would... Uh, carry them away pretty quickly. We usually have to fasten them to it, too, because the uh, wind, wind can take it away. Yeah. Great. And how do you celebrate the eighth day? Well, I, didn't well, ask you, I didn't ask you how you celebrate the first day. Uh, do, you, do you have a feast? or? Well, we read the scripture that applies to that time, and we do eat, and we have a... We usually have a big daytime cookout. Like, we get the grill, and, and we'll cook some... Uh, meat of some sort and, and we'll just have a big festival you know as a family you know we because we don't travel you know other people who do travel that's uh, what they're doing also you know but they're doing it among the other uh, fellow believers and uh, we're doing it more here as a family but uh, we will get together probably over at our, at our facility as well you know later that afternoon so well, we, we uh, have done that you know, in, in years past. So we, we plan on getting together also over there. That's why we, I say we can drive on those days, you know, because you can start fires and you can drive to, to get to places like that. I just wouldn't buy anything, you know, on those well, days. Why would you have another feast over there if you've got a group of people that are going to meet with you? Or? Well, there are a number of people that have, you know, said that they'd like to get together on that Wonderful. day. Wonderful. So we definitely get together whenever people, you know, ask and they say, well, you know, we'd like to get together and study and learn, just like we're doing here. Uh, we'll talk about the same sorts of things and we'll read scripture. And, 
Of course, there won't be any seminar or anything like that. It's just going to be for fun because I'm taking the day off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like these very informal little chats, chats that we have. And I don't, we don't have anything. We don't have prepared. Uh, I have nothing that I've prepared. Yeah. You know. So you would do the same thing on the eighth day as well? Exactly. Yeah. And remember what it signifies. Yeah. You know. The, what does it uh, signify again? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, it, it the the eighth day will signify. Uh, it reflects back to the day that Yahushua was circumcised. Of course, the uh, in the ending festival is called Simchat Torah, which means the joy of Torah. So the whole all of the festivals and of the redemptive plan all end up in one place, and that's the the joy of Torah. In fact, I've often thought that it would be the joy that we're going to feel that it points back to, the, because we're going to be united with the living Torah himself, you know, Yahusha. And when we're in that booth with him, when it really actually happens, when the bride enters the household and is with their Redeemer, New the, joy, Jerusalem. the joy of Torah is going to be the overarching thing. You know, we're going to all feel united and and one with our husband again. And right now we feel like we're all at each other's throats and critical of one another. But all that's going to just fade into nothingness. And we'll say, what was that about? You know, I'm so happy, you know, and the Torah will be just all around us. And there won't be anyone around us that's like argumentative or hateful or uh, not a Torah lover, you know, the Torah, the love of the Torah is a hard thing for people to get a hold of. But once you just surrender to it, you say, well, I just, I just want to be, I, I want to be able to obey, but I, you have to love the Torah in order to obey. But he's the one that inscribes the love for the truth in your heart. And so being with him is, is what it's really all about. And so I think at the end of it, it's just going to be like the number eight completion uh, not just completion, but a new beginning too, you know. So we'll have all eternity ahead of us. And, you know, we'll say, well, this is great and we won't have any problem. Torah is going to rule. It's going to flow from Yerushalayim into all the nations and we're going to see the joy of it. And, you know, I think that's what it points to. Yeah. The future. What a blowout. <laughs> yeah. Blowout. Yeah. A real blowout. Yeah. You know? Wow. Yeah, yeah. This this is also a sign of the Torah, you know, the menorah and shofar. A warning sign is what it is. These are these are warning devices. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. Thank you for all that info, bro. It's amazing. I guess you can edit some of that out and make it shorter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wonderful stuff. Thank you, brothers and sisters. This for this episode of Torah Talk uh, about the feasts: Yom Teruah, Yom Kafar. What do you call the last two? Well, the uh, the last two, yeah. Yom Kippur. Yeah. Well, Sukkot is uh, Sukkot is the the first day of Sukkot, and the eighth day, uh, which is the last great day, Simchat Torah, Simchat Torah, the joy of Torah, and wow. uh, found, it just ends up with being just the the joy of Torah. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, everybody have a nice Yom Teruah yes. next week. Yes. Those of you that are observing. Yes. And if you don't, if you can't afford or don't have a, a ram's horn. There you oh, go. Man. All right. <laughs> we well, love you we'll all. See, see you next week at the same time. Yes. Thank you, brother. Okay. See you later. Bye-bye. We love you. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.